We continue today reviewing the fundamentals. This time we will go over some concepts in molecular biology with a focus on understanding omics data that we will need during this course. If at any point you get lost or encounter unfamiliar concepts, just pause the video and make a comment about it. We will revisit any confusing points later. First of all, we must recognize that there will be very important differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic organisms. In this course, we will primarily deal with prokaryotic examples, but the principles of data analysis should be very similar. So let us begin by bringing up the idea of the central dogma of molecular biology. As originally stated by Francis Crick, the central dogma simply says that information can be transferred from nucleic acids to other nucleic acids and from nucleic acids to proteins, but it cannot be transferred from proteins to proteins or back to nucleic acids. However, a more common interpretation of the central dogma is as follows. The fundamental molecule storing information is the DNA. And in order to maintain and spread information through time and generations, DNA must undergo replication. Next, information stored in DNA is transferred by base complementarity in small packets to RNA through the process of transcription. Finally, this information is decoded by triplets, or codons, to sequences of amino acids to produce proteins in the process of translation. Evidently, this is all about the flow of information, how information is stored, transferred, and decoded. This information is ultimately used in the form of proteins to produce some biological activity, either indirectly through the synthesis of metabolites or directly by protein action. However, as you may already know, this process is not so neatly linear. For example, RNA molecules are known to produce biological actions themselves through the catalysis of reactions, and DNA molecules can also be functional by themselves, notably through physical protection of other DNA fragments and other structural activity. Moreover, we now know that information in viral RNA can be transferred back to DNA in a process called retrotranscription. And we also know that information in proteins can be transferred to other proteins, as is the case of proteins with a misfolding pattern that can be transmitted to regularly folded proteins, called prions, short for proteinaceous infectious particle. Therefore, the ostentatiously dubbed central dogma is rather a misnomer, we have never really accepted it as dogma, but rather as a useful model to begin understanding the complexities of information flow in biological systems at the molecular level. However, the centrality of information to molecular biology is of note, because it establishes the deep interconnection with information and data sciences that we will explore during this course. Now, let's focus on these four groups of molecules, DNA, RNA, proteins and metabolites. How do we currently study collections of these molecules in high throughput in what are called the omics sciences? The most common setup is the analysis of isolate cultures. Isolate cultures are a collection of many genetically identical cells, typically derived from a single mother cell. The most common omics techniques applied to isolates are the study of complete genomes, or genomics, the snapshot study of all transcribed RNA at a given time, or transcriptomics, the identification of all proteins expressed at a given time, or proteomics, and the detection of biochemical signatures for all metabolites at a given time, or metabolomics, which is ideally complemented with genetic and or biochemical studies. Importantly, this type of setup is limited to organisms that we can grow in culture, and there are other alternatives. One is by characterizing single cells, which can be directly extracted from the environment through single-cell genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. Another option is trying to characterize entire communities altogether. The studies of all the DNA transcribed RNA and expressed proteins from entire communities are called metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, and metaproteomics. Entire communities, including the surrounding milieu, can also be studied through metabolomics. 
Finally, we can also characterize entire communities using DNA without studying the entire collection, just by focusing on marker genes, and this is called barcoding. These are only some omics techniques. Many other exist, but beware of the uncontrolled growth of unwarranted omics neologisms, sometimes referred to as badomics. Have you encountered any badomics in literature? Share them in the comments. In this course, we'll mostly focus on genomics, metagenomics, barcoding, and transcriptomics, and we will mention some aspects of single-cell genomics and metabolic reconstructions. In fact, we will mostly focus on the analysis of DNA sequence data, so let's dig a little deeper on this one molecule. In a typical prokaryote, DNA is normally organized in a single circular chromosome of about 1 to 5 million base pairs, and oftentimes one or more plasmids of a few thousand base pairs. Do you know any examples of prokaryotes with more than one chromosome? How about linear chromosomes instead of circular ones? If we zoom in, we can find regions of the genome that are transcribed to RNA, called genes. One of the traditional problems in bioinformatics is the prediction of coding regions, or genes, based solely on the DNA sequences. Although this problem is not fully solved yet, we nowadays have highly accurate algorithms for gene prediction, often based on Markov modeling. Most of you are likely very familiar with these concepts, at least in some model organism. Therefore, I'll quickly go through a few concepts just to refresh terminology. Reading frame, each of the six ways in which a DNA sequence can be divided in triplets, or codons. Codon table, the specific genetic code followed by the molecular machinery in an organism. Start and stop codon, special codons that indicate the beginning and end of a coding region, respectively. Operon, region of DNA with consecutive genes transcribed together, sharing a single promoter. Transcriptional regulation, mechanisms by which cells control the transcription of DNA to RNA. Intergenic region, stretch of DNA located between genes, part of the non-coding DNA. If you are unfamiliar with any of these concepts, or feel like you need a refresher, Please pause the video and look up any terms you need, or just ask about it in the comments. If you feel confident about all these terms, check out the comments and try to answer any questions others might have. Now, let's review a very special cluster of genes, the ribosomal RNA operon. This is a collection of RNA genes that form the ribosome, which is the molecular machinery that performs the process of translation. All currently known life forms require ribosomes to produce functional proteins, and both prokaryotes and eukaryotes have ribosomal RNA genes organized in operons. Here we will focus on a specific gene, the ribosomal RNA component of the small ribosome subunit, which is also called 16S rRNA gene in prokaryotes and 18S rRNA gene in eukaryotes. This single gene served as the foundation of the famous three-domain model of the Tree of Life proposed by Woods and Fox, and it's still used as the backbone of contemporary prokaryotic taxonomy. This model divides all living organisms in three ancestral domains. Bacteria, sometimes referred to as eubacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Bacteria and archaea share many characteristics and are therefore frequently studied together. We refer to both of these domains as prokaryotes, but note here that the group of prokaryotes is not a monophyletic group. In the study of eukaryotes, sometimes the focus shifts from the 18S towards the adjacent intergenic sequences known as ITS1 and ITS2, especially for barcoding. In the study of prokaryotes, however, barcoding continues to focus on the 16S RNA gene. Here you can see the small ribosomal subunit of Thermus thermophilus. Along the 16S gene, some regions are highly conserved between organisms, even distant ones, whereas some regions are highly variable. These variable regions are very important because they allow us to distinguish between closely related organisms. In fact, most barcoding studies don't actually use the entire 16S gene, but only one or two of these variable regions. This brings up the issue of genetic resolution, which we will explore later in the course. 
Now, I have been representing genes with boxes, but of course we got to remember that these boxes are nothing but a representation of sequences of nucleotides. The reading of these strings of nucleotides is called DNA sequencing, and it is the basis for obtaining digitalized DNA sequence data. DNA sequencing has been advancing very rapidly since the early 2000s, when sequencing a million base pairs will cost about 5,000 US dollars. It is often compared to the prediction of Moore's law. According to Moore's law, the number of transistors produced in the world is expected to double every two years. Applied to DNA sequencing, it is often interpreted as the cost of sequencing is expected to halve every two years, as shown here. In reality, DNA sequencing costs have actually dropped at a much faster rate, underscoring the importance of continued computational advances in software for the analysis of sequence data, since we cannot possibly expect hardware to advance as fast as DNA sequencing data is being produced. This big drop around 2008 marks the transition of most laboratories from Sanger sequencing to short-read next-generation sequencing, or NGS. We are currently on the verge of a similar transition, now from NGS to high-throughput long-read sequencing. Finally, let's review the two most common strategies to sequence entire genomes or other large fragments of DNA. Traditionally, a common strategy has been to break large molecules of DNA into pieces of intermediate size, or large fragments, and then shear and sequence each of these fragments separately, to then reconstruct them computationally using assembly techniques. In this strategy, the assembly has to deal with a smaller sequence space, therefore improving accuracy and quality. But it also requires significant effort on the laboratory processing of each large fragment separately. A more commonly used strategy nowadays is to simply shear entire genomes into small fragments to be sequenced and then attempt a full assembly. This is called whole genome shotgun and is the basis for most genomics and metagenomics studies. However, we might be able to entirely bypass this whole problem of requiring short fragments soon with the advent of accurate long reads. To recap, we discussed the central dogma of molecular biology as well as the exceptions to it. We talked about the major omics techniques and focused on genomes and genes. We talked in some detail about the ribosomal RNA gene and the three domains of life. And we briefly discussed DNA sequencing.